All right. So, uh, hey, hi, hello, everyone. So glad you're able to join uh, for this presentation. Uh, I am Dr. Jordan Scan, as Olivia said. Uh, I'm a public health specialist here at the Alaska Native Epidemiology Center, housed in the Alaska Naval, Native Tribal Health Consortium. Uh, I'm the son of Norman Scan from Cloak, Alaska, and Sonia Scan from Three Hills, Alberta. And I am Clinkett uh, of the Eagle Wolf Moiety, uh, Cogwanton from the Drum House. And I'm here today to share with you about tribal partnerships, coalitions and communities of practice. I'll also be sharing my experiences working with developing an online community of practice too. Um, but I want to acknowledge two things before we begin. Some of this information may seem basic, but I still hope that you uh, really engage with the material. Uh, some of it may be a reminder of what you already know, but some of it may give you a fresh perspective on these incredibly important topics. Second, I'd like to acknowledge that we likely have some experts on tribal partnership, coalition building, and creating COPs. And I do have space at the end of this presentation to hear from all of you about your experiences. And I hope you share um, at that point other important ideas or tips for the group so that we can all benefit from your experience. Um, first, we will be talking about tribal partnerships. So what is a tribal partnership? Well, they're collaborative relationships between tribal entities and other organizations. These partnerships provide a number of great benefits as they allow for and enhance resource sharing, they provide cultural exchanges and lead to mutual support. Developing meaningful partnerships shows respect for both for sovereignty and elected leaders. And when you follow a nation's process for outreach and engagement, you affirm tribal sovereignty and demonstrate that the elected tribal leaders deserve equal rights to other elected leaders. And it allows tribes to lead and use knowledge collectively to benefit our communities. So how do we develop tribal partnerships? Well, before I get into that, I would like to highlight a key lesson when discussing tribal partnerships, and that is, Generalizations don't really work. Lessons learned from building tribal partnerships with one tribe is good and definitely worth review, but may not be able to apply directly to working with another tribe. When you're working with one tribe, the best way to learn their history and about them is to ask them directly. It's very likely that their history is gonna be wholly different and unique from other tribes' history. Uh, it's important to remain open to learning about other ways of knowing and being, and to remember that the indigenous worldview differs from the Western worldview in many ways. There are commonalities across Indian country and also tribal specific differences and place specific nuances as well. With that in mind, the first step in building tribal partnerships is identifying potential partners can be community organizations, health agencies, educational institutions. It will really vary greatly from location to location, and it's vital to begin to develop and cultivate contacts within the local Indian Health Center, social services programs, and become familiar with your local tribe. Approaching and engaging partners requires respectful communication and cultural sensitivity. Relationship building looks different with each tribe, each tribal department or organization, and each tribal member. Like I mentioned before, generalizations do not work. Instead, practice flexibility. Be observant, be mindful, engage in self-reflection, ask questions, and most importantly, keep trying. Approach partnerships with creative creativity, patience, preparation, planning, and respect in relation to the indigenous worldview. With this in mind, kind of an actionable idea that I can give you today is to engage when possible in face-to-face -face meetings before con connecting via email, phone calls, or text whenever possible. Now, this may not always be possible, but I really do encourage you to try and prioritize face-to-face -face meetings for that very first interaction. 
also to aid in your efforts in building tribal partnerships, I have collected a list of some key elements. Now, this list is limited, and I hope later during our presentation you might be able to add to it and share your own experiences. Uh, so understanding that this is non-exhaustive, some key elements of successful tribal partnerships are, first, trust and mutual respect. And that really means honoring traditions and offering transparency. Respect cannot be understated and sometimes can be the most vital aspect of successful collaboration with a community you're hoping to build a partnership with. As I discussed, generalizations don't work, and it's important to approach each potential tribal partnership with fresh eyes and a willingness to learn. Remembering that Alaska Native men and women, people, and tribes are experts on their own lives. Approaching with genuine respect and transparency is vital. When possible, hire Native individuals or tribal members as liaisons for projects and as full-time staff members or build a Native Advisory Council. Financially compensate whenever possible or provide stipends and gifts. Another way to show respect that aids in tribal partnership building is to attend tribal and Native community and events as appropriate. Many tribes host powwows, celebrations, and other events that are open to the community. These opportunities give a chance to experience the tribe's culture, values, diet, dancing, singing, and so much more. And it can really help individuals or organizations build a relationship and reputation with the community. Clear communication is vital when we're working with our tribal partners, and it's really best practice to be authentic and honest. Be clear about what resources or support you can offer the tribe of the Native community and what you cannot. Be realistic about timelines, barriers, and plans for sustainability are all part of being honest and engaging in that clear communication. With that said, Sometimes relationship building includes misunderstandings, mistakes, repressures to relationships, and when that happens, if it does, it's important to initiate or to show up to restorative conversations, to acknowledge the issues, to repair the harm, and to rebuild that trust when it's needed. Allowing tribes to make a decision about themselves, tribal lands, and to the extent possible about decisions that affect them is really important. It's essential to keep in mind that tribal governments are sovereign nations. The United States recognizes that tribal nations are sovereign governments with all the rights and powers of self-government. Tribal governments determine their own governance structures, pass laws, and enforce those laws through their own police departments and tribal courts. They are, in essence, separate nations existing within the borders of the United States. The history behind their rights, sovereignty, and relationships to other government agencies is incredibly important for understanding tribal and indigenous involvement. And this history and the underlying concepts are not often taught in schools or integrated into messaging with the general public. Therefore, Learning about tribal sovereignty, if you're not familiar with it, is really essential and can be really key when you are trying to build tribal partnerships. Next, it's important to plan to take time. In many Native communities, introduction is extremely important. And it's also important to allow time for broad introduction of many tribal members. Often the official tribal leaders will not be the first contact that you have with the tribe. Sometimes you might be connecting first with elders or other traditional members of the community who can provide the information needed to build a strong collaboration. So another actionable idea that I can give you from that idea um, would be to cultivate, you know, a one to two page document or even a short video explaining who your organization is and what resources or funding you can offer to tribes or how you are poised to support their initiatives or current projects. That way you have that kind of a cheat sheet for introductions that really kind of lays everything out in a very clear and open way. Also, another key concept is to understand that some attempts to collaborate may be met with hesitancy or resistance. Be patient. 
ask questions of what they need to proceed, and recall that harmful, violent, and oppressive policies and actions against Native peoples and their culture both existed and continue to exist. Rebuilding trust and reconciling relationships to foster lasting partnerships reaches simply beyond acknowledging the painful history and colonized lands and waters. Really, effective partnerships are built on ensuring that Native knowledge and experiences are genuinely integrated into sustainable practices. Be patient, be open-minded, and be honest about the timeline of your partnership building. So those essential elements uh, or those aspects of building tribal partnerships shouldn't be disregarded once the partnership exists. Rather, they should be continued throughout the whole relationship. But there are some other important topics to keep in mind when you're thinking about maintaining true life tribal relationships. Uh, first among those is regular communication. It's vital. This includes regular meetings to provide updates and feedbacks. And really, relationships need to be maintained, and their lifeblood is open and continuous conversation. As I discussed previously, collaborative decision making is another important aspect of maintaining partnerships. To do this, it's important to maintain an inclusive process and shared leadership, again, allowing tribes to have a voice and be involved in their decision making. Further, as they arise, it's vital to address challenges, and this can be completed by having that open dialogue, being honest and transparent, and if issues arise, using respectful conflict resolution strategies. So next, we're going to begin discussing building and sustaining coalitions. So often community problems like addressing health promotion are too large and complex for one agency or organization to handle. In these cases, creating a coalition, which is an alliance for combined action, can be an effective strategy for bringing about change in programs and policies that is needed to solve the problem or achieve a goal. Put simply, a coalition is a group of individual or organizations with a common interest who work together towards a common goal. Coalition members can come from a broad and diverse background and it can include representatives of nearly every segment of the community. So when I speak about communities of practice in a little bit, you're gonna hear a little bit of overlap in their definition, so just keep that in mind. But a coalition should be formed to focus a community on a particular problem, to create connections of individuals who do not typically work together or interact, and to provide consistency. They can come together to influence or develop public policy around a specific issue, changing people's behavior, or to build a healthy community which again, it's one of those broad terms, but that's not only physical health, it can also include preventative and wellness issues, housing, community planning, substance use, social and psychological health. But really, that's not just it. There are many other reasons that coalitions may be brought together. A few examples include to address an urgent situation, to empower elements of the community, to obtain or provide services, to bring about more effective and efficient delivery of programs, and eliminate unnecessary duplication of effort, for planning community-wide initiatives, to increase communication among groups, to create long-term permanent social change, and to break down group stereotypes. So when we're talking about building a coalition, there's a couple of different strategies that can be useful for a successful coalition. And that includes having a shared vision, diverse membership, and a clear structure. A coalition needs to have a purpose if it's gonna be, uh, so sorry. A coalition is gonna need to have a purpose if it's gonna be successful. Like we discussed before, the purpose may be broad or it's going to be narrow, but it's really unlikely that a diverse group will come together unless there's a reason to do so. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to be providing links to a free coalition building toolkit from the Prevention Institute that's really awesome, uh, which includes eight steps uh, to follow in order to build a successful coalition. 
And that first step is analyzing the objectives. So like I talked about, a coalition is a prevention tool. So groups really need to be specific about what needs to be accomplished. After the needs have been determined, the group must consider if the coalition is the best approach to meet the identified needs. So maybe it's not even the most appropriate building. Next, if you decide to move forward with it, it's really important to recruit the right people. The group's objectives will prescribe the type of coalition that needs to be developed. And some groups may choose to start small to accomplish specific tasks and then strategically expand. Depending on the needs of the coalition, either program directors or more frontline staff should be encouraged to attend. In addition, invite community members, youth leaders, politicians. Again, it's about recruiting the right people for the needs that your coalition is hoping to address. The third step there then is devising objectives. A key to a successful coalition is the early identification of common goals and benefits of working together. The coalition must avoid competing with its members for funding. An important consideration for adopting specific coalition activities is to identify some of those short term outcomes. Next, when you've done that, finally, you get a convene. The coalition must, uh, you know, gets to convene, and that can be anything from a workshop, a conference, or even virtually. But it's a really great sense of accomplishment when you get to have that first meeting for sure. Next, it's important to anticipate what resources you need. So lead agencies usually provide staff time to keep the coalition up and running and to handle the detail work. Though coalitions can usually run on a pretty minimal budget, but each member's time is a really valuable contribution. Next, it's uh, the next step that's really important is developing structure. So structural issues of the coalition can include how long the coalition will exist, meeting locations, meeting frequency and length, decision-making processes, meeting agendas, membership rules, and participation between meetings by subcommittees and planning groups. Next, it's important to maintain that vitality. So methods for noting and addressing problems, sharing leadership and recruiting new members, providing training on identified needs, and collaborating successes can help ensure a coalition's viability and success. And then finally, really important step can't be understated is improving through evaluation. Each coalition activity and event should include evaluations. And this can be as simple as a satisfaction survey, or it could be more formal like the use of pre and post tests of specific subject knowledge. So by following those steps, you can allow for the creation of a successful coalition to be put together. And again, I'll be providing links to this specific toolkit after this training. There are also some common roadblocks to starting coalitions that it's important to be mindful of. Turf issues can prevent organizations to want to work together to share their work, especially sharing efforts and funding. Bad history might be another barrier that prevents organizations from coming together and doing that important work that needs to be done. Um, so it, a new coalition may really have to contend with history and bad blood before they can start the work that needs to be done. Another pretty common uh, barrier or roadblock that you might experience in a new coalition is really the domination by professionals and poor links to the community. These can be aided by involving the right people from the beginning, like we were talking about, and ensuring that there's an environment of participation from all in the coalition members and kind of reining in those that feel like they have all of the answers. And again, that's it's another fairly common barrier in coalition building. Uh, another roadblock that people often stumble into is organizational capacity and lack of leadership. It can really destroy a coalition before it even gets off the ground. Ensuring that leadership and organization is built within the coalition is vital to ensure that the first meeting even gets scheduled. 
The second step in the guide, like I talked about, is recruiting the right people. And that's incredibly helpful in preventing those barriers. And like I said, there may be a little bit of uh, overlap in community or coalition building and creating a community of practice, which is uh, what I'm going to talk about now. Okay, so if you see me getting a little bit excited, that's because this is an area that I have a great deal of recent experience in, developing an online community of practice. Like I mentioned, I was hired to the Alaska Native Epidemiology Center, housed within ANTHC, under the Good Health and Wellness in Indian Country grant. And my role was to assist in developing an online community of practice for or other recipients. So what is a community of practice or a COP? Well, it's a group of people who share a common concern or set of problems or an interest in a topic who come together to fulfill both individual and group goals. Sound familiar? It sounds kind of like a coalition. Uh, but rather than a specific goal like a coalition may be focused on, a COP is formed to focus on sharing best practices and creating new knowledge to advance a domain of professional practice. Interaction is on an ongoing basis, and it's an important part of this. COPs are a formalized definition developed by cognitive anthropologists when studying apprenticeships as a learning model. However, it's not a new idea or method. Rather, COPs have existed since time immemorial and can be found everywhere, even when there's no formal apprenticeship present. The authors who define the COPs actually identified a number of historical examples. So, like a tribe learning to survive, a band of artists seeking new forms of expression, a group of engineers working on similar problems, a clique of school pupils defining their identity in the school, a network of surgeons exploring novel techniques, a gathering of first time managers helping each other cope. These are all naturally forming COPs that have existed since forever. But since the term was developed and identified, a growing number of people and organizations in various sectors are now focusing on communities of practice as a key to improving performance. So what makes a community of practice a community of practice? Well, there are three characteristics that are really crucial. First, there has to be a domain. And this is the shared area of interest or knowledge that brings the community together. The domain provides a common ground and a sense of identity. Members are committed to the domain and their shared competence distinguish members from other people. Next, the community. So members interact and engage with each other. They build relationships that enable them to learn from each other. And this involves activities like discussions, shared information, and mutual assistance that help in developing that sense of belonging to a collaborative spirit. Finally, the practice. So members of COPs are practitioners. They develop a shared repertoire of resources, experiences, stories, tools, and ways of addressing reoccurring problems. This shared practice binds the community together and helps in collectively advancing their knowledge and skills. These three characteristics ensure that a community of practice is not just a group of people with similar interests, but rather a cohesive unit that actively collaborates and learns together. There are really so many benefits to creating and maintaining online communities of practice. Knowledge sharing, ensures that the best practices and solutions to common barriers aren't being kept siloed within different individuals or organizations. It allows for professional, develop, professional development of COP members, allowing them to grow and flourish with their peers. And it provides support across the network where people can seek guidance, identify gaps, and request information. There are really five crucial functions to what a COP does. It educates people by collecting and sharing information related questions and issues of practice. It supports others by organizing interactions and collaboration among members. It really cultivates knowledge 
by assisting groups to start and sustain their learning. It encourages members by promoting the work of members through discussion and sharing, and it integrates people by encouraging members to use their own knowledge for real change in the work that they do. So how do you develop an online community of practice? Well, the first step is really to clearly identify the need for such a community and set some specific goals. Here's how you can do that. First, assess the need. Consider the challenges and opportunities within your domain of interest. Identify the gaps in knowledge or practice that an online COP could help to address. Gather input from potential members to understand their needs and expectations. And once you do that, define the goals. So establish what you want to achieve with your COP. This could include sharing best practices, fostering innovation, or supporting professional development. When you do that, then you can set both short and long-term goals that are measurable and realistic. Ensure that the goals align with the needs of the community and the broader organizational objectives. The next step that's incredibly important is to select the right platform. So choosing the uh, appropriate platform for your online community of practice is crucial for facilitating the effective communication and collaboration. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that later when I go into my own experiences working with a, uh, developing a COP, but there's a couple of different things you consider. So it's important to look at the different options, you know, research the various platforms that offer features that would be appropriate for what your community needs. This can include online discussion forums, file sharing, real time chat and video conferencing. Um, consider platforms that are user friendly and accessible to all members. Uh, it's also important to look at the different features that are available and ensure that the platform supports the type of interactions and activities your community will actually engage in. And look for features that promote engagement, such as notifications, polling, and integration of other tools your community might, members might already use. Also, it's important to consider the cost of the platform and whether it fits within your budget and ensure the platform can scale if your community grows. Step three in developing an online COP is then inviting and onboarding the members. It's the exciting part. Once you've uh, identified the need and selected the platform, you then can invite and onboard people. Uh, and there's a couple of different things that can be helpful with that. And that's like creating an invitation strategy. So identify those potential members who would benefit and contribute to your community and send personalized inv invitations explaining the purpose of the COP, its goals, and how they can participate. Develop a clear onboarding process to help new members get started, and that includes like welcome emails, user guides, or even introductory webinars. If possible, provide an orientation to familiarize new members with the platform and all of its features. And then, especially when you're getting it off the ground, it's important to foster early engagement. Encourage new members to introduce themselves, to share their interest and expertise, and start those initial discussions or activities to build momentum and demonstrate the value in participating in the community. So by following these steps, identifying the need, selecting the right platform, and inviting and onboarding members, you can lay the foundation for a strong, vibrant, effective online community of practice. Remember, the key to success is ongoing engagement and continuous improvement based on feedback from your members. So. I'll be going in depth about this topic, maintaining online communities of practice, when I share about my experience in maintaining a COP. But there are a number of key concepts that I want to highlight that it's important to be aware of once the COP has been built. First, facilitating discussions. Regular prompts and engaging topics, they're key. You wanna keep that momentum that you built when you laid the foundation going. It's also vital to ensure that the group is providing resources. So that's articles, 
webinars, tools, and having a way to document those for future reference is incredibly helpful. Next, monitoring and evaluation can ensure that the COP is functioning correctly and it's meeting its goals. And those can really be obtained by feedback surveys or even participation metrics, like are people showing up and are they interacting? As I mentioned, I work with the Good Health and Wellness in Indian Country, or GWIC grant, as part of its coordinating center, which known as CCG, that's what we call ourselves. Uh, and GWIC is really the CDC's largest investment to approve American Indian and Alaska Native tribal health, and it's focused on health promotion and chronic disease prevention. Uh, and so we have members from across the US. So you see that map there on the left. All of those circles are different direct recipient sites, uh, and those are the people who I work with. And the triangles, those are some of the sub-awardees of our component two recipients. More on that in just a minute. So really, you can see the community that I was tasked with building is spread across a large region. How do we get these people to interact and to, to come together? Well, when I was first hired, that was one of my major responsibilities, helping form and build momentum for the GWIC community of practice. And to provide a little bit of context on what that was like, there's a couple points that I wanna highlight. First, our community of practice existed on a number of different platforms. Initially, we hosted once a month video conferencing meetings hosted on Zoom. We also had a dedicated intranet site. So that's a page that only GWIC recipients could log into with a dedicated forum that anyone could post or reply to and share files with. We also planned, keyword there, planned, to have yearly in-person meetings known as the gathering. Uh, that were supposed to be a time where we could come together, build and really kind of cement those relationships and connect with each other. Uh, another important part of the context uh, for our COP development, uh, it was a little bit of a benefit, but a little bit of a barrier is that the attendance for our COPs was actually a grant requirement. So as I discussed, typically COPs are formed naturally with interested individuals who come together with a desire to share resources, learn from each other and support each other. Now we had the benefit of it being required. So we had access to a large group of people. Those initial meetings in the beginning had anywhere from 30 to 60 individuals on the call. On the flip side of that, as it was a requirement, the desire to interact and engage in the COP varied greatly from individual to individual. Some were incredibly invested, but some just joined because it was a requirement. Like that sticker says, here because attendance was mandatory. Uh, further contextualizing the COP, I think I mentioned I joined in April of 2020, the very week my entire department and many organizations around the world were set to work from home due to the global pandemic. That severely limited the GWIC work and those limitations and feelings of uncertainty definitely dominated the early conversations of our COP. Unfortunately, it also prevented us from having those in-person gatherings for two years. Uh, benefit, from, benefit from this, however, if you can say that we had a benefit during the pandemic, was that the platform we used, Zoom, had significant development and improvements. Some of the things that we may take for granted uh, are just, it's just amazing compared to how it was in the earlier days. The stability of the calls has improved, you know, virtual backgrounds to ensure people are comfortable. Breakout rooms was a new feature. The ability to choose which breakout room you want to go to was another improvement that it really helped our uh, meetings improve. I actually often apologize to our early COPs, uh, Sometimes it would take us 10 minutes to even get the, minute, the meeting going because we would be so busy trying to manually put people into breakout rooms. 
And because we were using the meeting in this format and with this way and using breakout rooms manually, it would actually take five CCG staff members to facilitate a meeting. So, I mean, the outcome was great. We had really fruitful discussions, but the effort put in was tremendous. But by embracing flexibility and listening to feedback from our recipients, we were able to hear and meet some of their needs. And one of the ways that we did this was by significantly changing the structure of our meetings. So something that we found very helpful was that instead of large once a month, one and a half hour long meetings with breakout rooms, we began having bi-weekly meetings that altered month to month based on the four strategies of GWIC. And that restructure really allowed for shorter calls. It allowed for continued conversations because we'd have a more stable group of people who would attend the same COPs rather than randomly being split into different rooms. It allowed for recipients to attend groups that they wanted to and they didn't have to participate as often. Like I said, there was four different COP topic meetings, but they were only required to attend one of them, which means out of every two months, they only had to require joining one meeting. And that really allowed for them to want to engage more. And I, I would say that that restructure was one of the key to our success. So attendance did drop to about 15 to 30 individuals per call, but I mean, the discussions were a lot more intense and it made it so only one CCG staff had to facilitate those meetings rather than five. Another lesson learned when forming our online COP was the need for responsiveness. From the beginning, we collected feedback in the form of a year-end survey and that provided so much useful data. It's what led to the restructure that I just spoke about and why we started bringing in more guest presenters and subject matter experts. However, we realized that getting all of this information at the end of the year wasn't ideal. So actually beginning in year four, we started having a brief survey at the end of every single meeting. We used three questions that we found very useful. Uh, and those questions are, how was today's meeting on a scale of one to 10? One meeting not satisfied, 10 being completely satisfied. What suggestions do you have for improving the COP? And then also in planning for our next COP, what topic best fits your program needs? And these questions assisted us in planning discussions, planning guest presenters, and help us kind of have a barometer on how are the meetings going? How are the different improvements or different restructures we're doing working out? And really was so much more useful. So that's something that I would definitely encourage is not just the end of the year evaluation, but just ongoing continuous meeting by meeting interaction. Another way that we put responsiveness into action was by utilizing a SOAR analysis at the midway point of the grant, the grant to take stock of how the COP and the GWIC grant were doing uh, and what needs that the COP members had. So what is a SOAR analysis? A SOAR analysis focuses on the positives of an organization and uses them to form a strategy for the future. So SOAR, S-O-A-R, stands for strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results. So it's a collaborative tool. And what we did is during our meetings, we had a digital whiteboard with each of these four quadrants. We brainstormed together about what we think our strengths are. After everyone had a chance to brainstorm, we grouped similar ideas together to create themes. And actually, after all four of our COP meetings went through this, I combined them into one large SOAR analysis. You can see on the screen there, the, uh, the, the post-its are probably too small to see, but really this was a, a guide for moving forward and kind of taking stock of how things were doing. And again, responsiveness was key for CCG in developing our strong and useful community of practice. Another lesson learned uh, when it comes to the GWIC COP was the importance of preventing burnout. As the pandemic continued and as the required meetings went on and on and on and on, we recognized burnout uh, happening in a number of different ways. You know, sometimes people wouldn't turn their cameras on, they wouldn't respond to calls, and staff turnover became a more and more common occurrence. 
we were pretty mindful of this happening and we really put in a lot of efforts starting early. Uh, when the restructure happened, we also put extra efforts into planning each of the COPs. So before the cycle of four different COP meetings happened, we would convene together internally to discuss the structure of the meeting, the questions that we might use, and the guests that we would uh, involve. Uh, that right there on the screen is very busy, but that's my whiteboard, uh, the digital whiteboard we would use to plan each of the meetings. And it includes, you know, future idea topics, possible presenters, previous meeting ideas, and then all of the feedback that we got, we would see there too. And really, it was just a way for us to keep the meetings fresh. Um, that's one of the things that we found was incredibly helpful. Uh, and, you know, we did it a number of different ways, you know, it might sound silly, but icebreakers were really key in helping people start the meeting in a happy mood. Uh, I remember one of the most popular icebreakers we ever did was just asking people, what's your favorite emoji or what's your most used emoji? And that led to a 10 minute discussion where everyone went around the room and very excitedly shared what their favorite emoji was and why. Uh, we received feedback after that meeting that people felt more connected to their other individuals on the call. They felt like they got a deeper understanding of the people they worked with. And I'm, I'm not going to lie, that was one of our highest rated COPs and people were happy. And that went on including into the discussion questions that we decided that we decided for that meeting. Um, so yeah, icebreakers are, are really helpful. Um, changing format. So we also didn't just remain in the one large meeting uh, talking about discussion questions. That was our most common meeting format. But we also tried to change things up. We did different things like breaking out into smaller groups. We also did some networking opportunities where people were put one-on-one -on -one into rooms with some discussion questions where they were able to connect and make even deeper connections with those individuals in the network. So keeping meetings fresh was how we worked to prevent burnout. Finally, uh, we worked to encourage success in all of our meetings. Pretty early on, we received feedback that people liked strengths-based uh, discussion questions. So rather than saying like, what are all of your barriers? We made sure our discussion questions focused on things like, what gives you hope when you're doing GWIC work? Or what successes have you had in overcoming obstacles? We also learned later on that setting the tone was really helpful by creating share outs. So before each meeting, I would reach out to one or two organizations and ask them to come prepared with a two to three minute share out about a recent success or initiative they started. Uh, so after our icebreaker, the share out would happen and that really kind of set the tone for the meeting and actually having people prepared to share out in the beginning led to more people sharing afterwards uh, throughout the meeting it was really helpful. And then lastly, we wanted to make space for further connections and professional developments. So those COP rock stars we had, those people who were really engaged in the meeting, we actually created once a month coffee and tea. Uh, meetings, which were just another community of practice where people could come together. I would develop professional development topics and it was optional. It wasn't a mandatory meeting. So those people who wanted to be there and wanted to engage were able to join and make even more meaningful connections uh, with people within the network. So kind of to summarize from my lessons learned in developing an online community of practice, it was really important to be aware of the recipient's context and doing what we could to avoid and mediate those barriers, to be flexible in how we delivered the meetings and what was discussed, to be responsive to participant needs and to seek feedback from each meeting, and to hold the idea of burnout in mind and try to take efforts to prevent it, and arranging meetings to set recipients up for success.